Good morning, everyone. Just give it a few seconds for people to start dribbling in. All right, I'll start with the introductions. Um, my name's Toby Valwood. I'm the product lead here at Amazie IO. Um, I'm based in Canberra, um, but we're here for Sean. Um, we're here to learn about caching gamification. Um, Sean Hamlin is the um, the main technical account manager in the APAC region for Amazie IO. He's been with us a little bit over two years now. Um, and we were just joking that his uh, his most popular module on Drupal.org is the responsive fav icons, but secretly he wants to know who the four people who still use the uh, nine cat progress bar are. So if you're one of them, let Sean know. Um, during the presentation, Sean's completely open to take questions as you think of them. Um, so feel free to drop them in the Q and A section of the um, session and. If you can answer them as he's going, he will do that. But for that, we'll have a wrap up session at the end. We'll get through those questions. So drop them in as you go. I'll hand over to Sean. Thanks, Toby. Okay, thanks everyone for jumping in. All right, we're going through that. First thing I want to talk about, thank you for showing up. I know we've got a lot of slides, a uh, lot of competing talks here and which are all high quality as well. So thanks to you for, for showing up um, and hopefully uh, learning a little bit about what we're um, going to talk about today, which is um, I'll go through Amazio in one minute in case you don't know who we are. Um, a little bit about HTTP caching in case this is new to you or you want a bit of a refresher. Um, a little bit about why uh, HTTP caching is uh, a good thing and why should you care. We'll talk about this new tool that was developed uh, called Caching Score, and uh, I'll unleash you upon that as well. So you can actually use the tool whilst I'm doing my presentations. So you can ask some really curly questions if you want, up to you. And uh, where to from here? Where's the tool going? Uh, how's it going to be adapted, etc. Uh, so Quickfire, Amazing IO, uh, we are the host uh, things. Not necessarily websites, it could be other things as well. Um, but it's all it's all web ops. So you push code and code gets translated into objects running inside Kubernetes. It's all magic. Um, I highly recommend doing it. And uh, yeah, we can host anywhere in the world. So if you've got a favorite data center um, that you really like things to run in, that's all good. And uh, we support you know, pretty much every major time zone with people in there. So we're 24-7, 365. Um, a big point of difference is that we're uh, open source first. So the hosting product we've got, Lagoon, which Toby is the product manager for, is entirely open source, which is absolutely kind of awesome. And yeah, as a result, um, you yeah, know, we've got a lot of people that value that. And uh, if you want to know more, you can ask us after the session. And a quick refresher on HTTP caching. All right. This is what websites did back in 1999. Um, we had a web server, which was probably Apache 2 or 1, uh, and you had a bunch of people, and those people visited your website. And your little web server kind of chugged along. Uh, the main problem was that is that you have basically only so much capacity on your web server and sometimes you'll have a lot more visitors than you expect so the next step up i guess is having local browser caching which kind of helps to some degree because your browser can remember it's downloaded an image and maybe not request it the next time so this helps a little bit but doesn't really solve all the problems uh, the next step really is introducing the sort of concept of a, a shared cache which you can plug in for, say, Varnish, uh, if you will, and have all your users visit your shared cache. 
that sits in front of your web server and helps to offload it. The next problem is what happens when your users actually come from all over the globe? Having one Varnish server plonked in one country uh, isn't necessarily going to give you the gains that you think it might. Um, the latency between um, geographically the regions might be two to 300 milliseconds and then you multiply that by the number of assets you have, all of a sudden your website's now perceivably slower than what it could be. So next level up, I guess, is having a shared cache that sits in the appropriate region. So you have one in this example, Australia, the US, and uh, England. I can't say Europe now, not Europe. And even leveling up even further is like, say you've got, you know, 70 points of presence around the world. Um, you don't want 70 requests for the homepage to come through. So what you do is you actually tear your shared caches. So this is called cache tearing or TED caching, and uh, it's kind of where you want to be. So this way you're kind of funneling all the traffic through a series of caches to get to your web server. And why should you care about any of this? Like, why not just rock out a single Apache server for all your visitors? So uh, it's faster. So time to first byte or TTFB is the time taken between sending the request and the very first byte of response coming back. It's kind of a measure on how, uh, how much latency in, between you and the end site is. Um, but also time to download the assets um, has a marked difference as well. There's a cost um, benefit here. So you can actually serve more people with the same stuff. So if you're rocking out a couple of web servers in the back, background, then that's maybe all you need. And say you get uh, you know, popular, say your tweet goes viral or you know you get TikToked like, you, like the youngsters do these days, then maybe your site has a chance of staying up. Uh, one of the features that most of uh, these caching services have is stampede protection. So if you have 100 people requesting your homepage at the exact same second, only one request will pop through back to your origin. And then when that response comes back to the edge layer, then 100 responses can go out to the end users. So it helps to you know, stop the onslaught of people hitting you. And if your origin's ever down, say you need to, I don't know, update Apache, then um, you, know, you won't be serving any traffic for that brief period of time. So in this case, most of these caching services will offer some form of serve while stale, which is the ability to serve previous content in the event that um, it can no longer update it. And to that point, um, this has kind of been in my mind for, I don't know, a, a year or two now, which is like, I often get asked questions about caching, which is like, hey, is this good? Um, you know, quite generic, quite broad questions like that. And, you know, I need to do a series of checks and work out. And I thought, surely I can write something that does this stuff for me because, you know, I, I I like to automate my life where possible, and this can really help offload my brain into a tool. So what you're about to see is that it's my brain personified in the tool. Um, so and this is something you can go to now as well. So if you have a browser up, go to www.cachingscore.com. It is live. It is uh, up until this point not being tweeted about. So um, if you find it useful, then yeah. Uh, get on the tweeters and the TikToks and make something. Um, so I talked to you a little bit about this tool um, and, you know, how, we, how you can use it, how you can interpret it. We'll go through some sample sites and, uh, yeah, talk a little bit about them as well. So this is its mission statement, I guess, distilled into one line. So it's a tool that you can use to assess how strong the caching abilities of a given site is. This is like SSL labs for SSL ciphers, but the equivalent for caching. That's what I'm hoping it to be. Uh, it's simple to use and understand at a glance. So I'm trying to distill all the complex information 
down into something that is more uh, understandable, especially for people that don't really care about TED caching and POPs and CDN providers and stuff like that. Provide a lot of education around the current score and also how to improve it as well. And it is written with a lot of plugins. So the idea is we can add checks, add additional CDNs, add additional CMSs uh, as and when the need arises. Uh, how does it work? So when you plug in a domain, which says is handy, giant size text box, text box at the top, when you plug in any domain up there, it will perform a series of HTTP requests. Quite a lot, maybe more than a dozen now, maybe more than 15. I, I don't know, I'll lose count. And then it records the responses and it analyzes the HTTP headers. And it works out what CDN, if any, it is using. And then based on what CDN it's using, then it can interpret the response headers more accurately. There are other tools out there at the moment that can just give you the response headers, but the problem is that every CDN is so quirky. And I'll go through uh, a few examples just to show you what I mean by, like it's a minefield out there. <laughs> so um, that's why this tool is a bit different. This tool actually puts the HTTP headers, HTTP headers in context of the current edge provider that the site's using. Um, there is rate limiting in effect, mainly to stop people using it as a vector for amplification attacks, because <laughs> I figured someone's probably going to try and do that. Um, so there is a rather generous rate limit. Um, so you won't hit it um, being a yeah, quote unquote normal user. Uh, these are the CDN plugins I've written so far. Um, it's by no means every CDN on the planet. It's only a subsection at the moment. Um, it's just for the ones that I've come across most recently. Um, and there's also one for a gen generic varnish reverse proxy as well. So like we cater for both just caching proxies and uh, actual CDNs as well. Um, this is probably my call to action for everyone that's cool, but hey, if you find something that caching score can do better, or maybe can help explain a bit better, or maybe you want a CDN to support it that's not currently supported, or maybe I'm interpreting the headers incorrectly for that given CDN, which is entirely possible. It's def definitely not perfect right now. Then there's actually a link to a contact form. Um, so plug in your email here. Your email is only needed so I can reply to you. Um, if you don't want to be replied to, then just make up an email. I'm not going to check it and then uh, put in your feedback message here and then click send and that will uh, send off an email to me. Uh, the tests at the moment are executed out of uh, Sydney, um, but this won't matter if your website's hosted in say another country, if you have a CDN in place. It's not perfect. Um, these are just the limitations I know about, but um, yeah. It only allows 10 seconds per HTTP request. And if your site's slower than 10 seconds, then I think you kind of know what your score is without me having to tell you. Um, I have seen some sites block caching score because of bot management tools. Um, so that you won't be able to score them, obviously, in that case. And some people configure their CDNs to strip every useful modicum of information out, which I find rather disappointing um, because how do you debug something that you can't inspect? So I don't know. I don't find that particularly useful, but there are a few sites out there that do that. And some more advanced features I just can't test. It's like a limitation purely of this tool. Like I can't test what happens to your content when your origin's down. Unless you want to take it, take your origin out, then do a scan and then put it back up again, but it's kind of risky. <laughs> and if you do see logs with a user agent of caching score slash 1.0, then you know where it's from. Someone's been scanning your site. Uh, and who decided on these checks and the scores? Um, they're just based on my experience in um, scaling websites. So 
they're by no means perfect. They will be tuned and adapted, and no doubt there'll be some feedback after this talk. Um, so I, I welcome it. And um, I haven't really mentioned it, but this, the point of this tool isn't really to to bag on anybody or say, oh, it's terrible, you suck. You know, it's not supposed to be like, be like that. It's more, how do we bring you up and how do we um, level up your caching? And uh, to that end, I'll go through a few examples. Not the contact us page. Um, I picked on our own website as well, which uh, is using uh, Gatsby and uh, a few other weird things that I'm not quite privy to. But anyway, it gets a B minus. So it's not great. It's not terrible. It's kind of in the middle. I think if you get a B, you know, you're not doing too bad. And you can see uh, a list of um, checks that have run. If it's green, you've got top marks. If it's red, you've got no marks. And if it's yellow, you've got some marks. Um, you know, it's oh, and I'm not a graphic designer, so if you see stuff in here that looks like it could be a bit better rendered, then yeah, that's probably why. But uh, in each check, you can actually click on them and expand it, and you can actually learn a bit more about the check. And uh, you know, every check starts off with this: what is it, and why should you care? And in order to get maximum points on this check, you need to have a time to first byte of 30 milliseconds or less. Um, and you can see the current time to first byte is two. So um, I can tell you for a fact that Fastly has a pop in Sydney. They have to because two milliseconds, you can't go very far in Australia on two milliseconds. Uh, there are a few other um, checks that we can um, probably talk about but like eTag support and last modified um, are very similar. Um, but again, I'm, I'm hoping to help explain what an e-tag identifier is. Um, yeah, so that's kind of another useful feature of uh, caching score. It actually goes off and does a background HTTP check on your behalf with a header of an if none match and then the e-tag to see if the actual uh, website responded with the 304, which is... Uh, you know, essentially, you're still good. That content you've got is still okay. Um, TED caching, I'm still working on some CDN providers to work out whether they actually do support it properly. Um, for Fastly, I can guarantee that this is accurate, but other CDN providers, I'm not as sure. Um, 404 is being cached. Well, Often people don't really think about their 404s until like after they go live and all of a sudden they're serving 10,000 404s out of origin that were from the previous website. So I think all 404s should be cached for some amount of time, um, like 60 seconds is better than nothing. Um, and uh, how it does that, it actually does a re request to a URL. It's definitely not going to be valid unless you're really cheeky and uh, create a URL for this on your site. But for the most part, this should be broken. And uh, I request it, and then I re request it again. And this, the second time I request it, it's not um, returning a cache hit, then we know it's um, definitely not caching for it falls. Uh, these two are related, but uh, query param stripping is something that you don't really think about until your marketing team dosses your site. And yeah, that has happened to numerous sites that I've uh, been involved with in the past. So the first one is the Facebook click ID or FBCLID. And uh, typically Facebook will append any, like this sort of garbage on the end of every URL you pop in Facebook. And uh, fun fact, this. Um, identifier is guaranteed unique for every user and click. So if you really want to destroy your site, post it on Facebook. And so, yeah, this check is all about if I request this URL, I should have a cache hit. Just requesting it once. And the same with uh, UTM. So this is more about um, like people doing Google AdWords uh, and stuff like that. So. Um, or even just popping links and you know, Twitter, people will often append this UTM uh, garbage on the end of it, like UTM medium and uh, stuff like that. So, um, yeah. 
the last one here is like how long the cache lifetime is said to be. And as you can see, there's a sweet bug there where I'm rounding up to one second where it should be clearly zero. But um, in order to get maximum points in your cache lifetime score, you need to have a cache lifetime of four weeks. Controversial, probably. I'm keen to have feedback on that, but I think with the advent of cache tags and Drupal 8, 9, and 10 supporting uh, cache tags, like there's no reason why you should be rocking out a short, fixed time to live. Um, you know, it should be one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks minimum, in my opinion. Um, and where it gets really crazy is I've actually parsing the HTML that's responded with, and then I'm pulling out a CSS file, a JavaScript file, and any images that live on the exact domain that you requested. So if you're using a subdomain of assets dot or CDN dot, I'm not gonna bother checking those. Um, the assets need to live on the exact domain that you've uh, requested. And I, I do pop in the list, the URL that you've actually got there. And these checks are the same checks that we perform on the HTML, but we just I just weight them a little bit less because um, you know they're not as influential, um, in my opinion, to the overall score. Um, and if you really want, there's the full HTTP response headers um, that are pertinent to caching down below. And if you really, really, really want, you can execute a curl command um to help you get the same information and draw your own kind of conclusions that way as well and you'll notice that there are these special dash capital h that's like send a special request header and it knows that this site's using fastly and it knows that fastly has a debug header so it's actually getting you to plug in the debug header that pertains to the cdn in question not all CDNs have debug headers. Um, some of them just omit it by default. Um, but if it does, then you'll see it there. Um, and I haven't really talked about it, but you can actually, if you want to see the headers for the JavaScript file, you can uh, click through and uh, yeah, see what the asset in question actually is. So you can see here, we're definitely not caching this for very long. And we should probably have a chat to the team, Toby, and make this one not a <laughs> not a zero. <laughs> um, cool. So in terms of like you know picking other sites, just go for gold. Like <clears throat> um, you can have a look and see, um, like make make sure that we've identified the CDN correctly, um, and you know just have a look at the scores and make sure you're kind of. Uh, you know, comfortable with all that. Um, I'll go through a few kind of interesting cases that I've found. Um, so this is uh, a site that's using uh, Imperva as the CDN. And I need to put more details into here about the cache hit, but it's actually not a cache hit. And uh, the only way you can discern this, and this is where it gets really kind of crazy, and I hope this is big enough to see, um, but they've got this header called XII info, and uh, the part that tells you whether it's a cache hit or not is this. It's the second character in this long string of gumball. N indicates not cacheable. So that's kind of what I mean by um, it's really hard to tell if a request was. Uh, actually served by the CDN if you don't have this information about the CDNs in question. Because a naive approach might be, oh, look at X cache and see if it's got the word hit. But actually, that's the varnish server that sits behind Imperva in this particular situation. Um, and that varnish server is not probably going to be geographically very close. So um, time to first bite, yeah. Here you can see we're, we're penalizing them here as well. So it's 103 milliseconds for uh, for this. So even though it was a varnish hit behind Imperva, because it wasn't a hit at Imperva, then um,
I think we may have temporarily lost Sean. Maybe his um, eight gig internet link has dropped or something, but we'll give it a few seconds to come back. In the meantime, if anybody's got any questions on what they've seen or um, similar sort of information they're looking for, please throw something in the Q&A. And if Sean doesn't come back, I'll have to answer it. So. Sean's just told me the powers just died in his house. So, um. many apologies for this. Um, and I'll point out that I have nothing to do with making the uh, <laughs> the Amazing IO website even more awesome. That's handled by people far more important than I. Um, so a question came in from Stephen on, is the CDN mandatory? Um, if you don't want to run us, as in we use the CDN to calculate part of the score, um, I there are very few examples that I would think of where you should be running your site without a CDN. Um, generally, the, um, the CDN, if you've got a very niche, target audience and you don't need any of the distributed um, consumption models of CN CDN, then yes, but there's so many other things. As a hosting provider, we see every single hit that comes to our back end, everything that hits your database, every request that comes through Varnish, um, and there's a lot. The CDN will do an awful lot to block some of the bad actors. Um, Sean and I are going to be in one of the sponsor sessions later today talking about how we proactively monitor a lot of customer stuff and how we do a lot of that blocking off our infrastructure. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, any CDN, and I think Tara said it, in the, any CDN is better than none um, because it just lifts that away from your infrastructure. And whilst you might have infrastructure that can scale, you might build your application to be able to scale. It just takes a tweet to go viral or someone to TikTok your website. I don't know if people can TikTok websites, but um, yeah, and that's why we put importance on CDN in that uh, in that score. Um, question from Nick about including a cache power ranking leaderboard of popular sites and a wall of shame. I mean, I don't know if Nick was in the session when Sean said it was explicitly not about shaming people, but um, we all know that there is no greater motivator than a poor score. Um, being able to show someone an F will make people jump through hoops. Um, whether we need to do that publicly, I, I don't know, but certainly encourage people to, to <laughs> find examples of sites that are done well and share them as a best practice thing. <laughs> um, let's not, let's not have the, uh, the humiliation of, of poor scored sites laughed around because we've we've all been there we've we've all made something that we know works um and copy of the presentation slides oh hey <laughs> hey sorry about that I, I and i i kid you not my power just died in my entire house um i don't know if it's out wider but um we're rocking out uh, on some uh, some 5G and now single monitor laptop. Um, so yeah, we'll see how all that goes. Um, catch me up, Toby, what happened? So, so <laughs> I, I answered a few questions. Um, none of the difficult ones. Um, 
but yeah, the, the couple of questions about is a CDN necessary? And um, yeah, we said CDNs are important. So yeah, if you've got if you've got a couple more sites to go through. Uh, I do. Let me see if I can. I'm now going to share the window I'm currently viewing. So it's going to be fun. Um, um, yes, we'll work out how to make these presentation slides available afterwards as well. But most of it's now, just that... screenshots of the website. So yeah, <laughs> is is this um, viewable, Toby? It is. Okay. Sweet. Okay. Cool. Um, I've heard this being talked about in the past. There's a few people probably on the call that deal with the site as well. Um, and here you can see my sweet CSS. So yeah. Oh my God. So good. Um, yeah. So this is an example of a site that's uh, Drupal. And um, one of the things I did want to talk about was um, the fact that there are actually some Drupal specific checks now in place. So um we can discern that javascript aggregation is turned on and uh i don't think css is because i think there's a front-end framework so yeah maybe take that one with a grain of salt um, but something that i do see a lot of um with drupal sites is uh the page cache module which kind of comes by default turned on i think in d8 plus um, and it's really good for tiny websites. Um, you know, if we go back to my slides, it's really good for the people that are rocking out on, um, you know, a single Apache. Um, yeah, really good for them, but not so good for anyone using a CDN like um, Amazon CloudFront. So yeah, in order to get points for this one, if you have a CDN, you need to disable the page cache module. Um, so at the moment, there's only three Drupal specific checks, but you know, if you have an idea on what else we could discern from the outside in, keep in mind, we can't run Drush, we can't access the database. We can only look at the response headers and the response body. But if there's something that you can discern that would be useful, I'm definitely keen to know more about that. Um, and if I do talk about CloudFront for a little while, um, Oh, sorry, my keyboard's not working because it's plugged into the. Um, yeah, OK, it's not actually showing up, but I'm pretty sure there is for a full caching for CloudFront. I just need to um, potentially force a cache miss. Yeah, so like there's, there's actually a few um, of these URLs that are quite n nuanced. So um, if we pick on this one here, um, how you tell that this was a cache uh, hit, and uh, um, and this is this is the stuff that the plugin system does for it as well. Like it says, error from CloudFront. You're like, oh, is it a cache hit or not? And it actually, if you read the docs, if you have an age of something, anything and error from CloudFront, it's a cache hit. So that's how to tell if CloudFront supports 404 caching. And probably the next question someone might ask is, give me an example of a perfect site. Um, I don't want to pronounce this because I will make an absolute mess of it, but it's uh, uh, Swiss German. So um, it means wildlife in English. Um, so it's kind of like an animal site. Um, but yeah, I haven't yet found any uh, checks that wouldn't uh, fail on this particular site. Um, they're using a cache lifetime of an extremely long period of time. They support everything that they need to. They are a Drupal site. They have everything kind of perfect as far as I can tell. Um, and yeah, I do need to talk more about this, but I'll do it in the explanations when I actually write the content. But I need to talk more about how S Max Age and Max Age um, coexist with each other. Um, cool. So I think that's everything I wanted to talk about um, from the actual tool perspective. Um, but yeah, definitely keen to have any uh, feedback pop through on the tool or through the discussion. 
chat and uh, we can, uh, is there any questions, Toby? Uh, Carl wants an API. <laughs> oh, Carl, um, <laughs> there is an API. So you've got forward slash scan. If you put forward slash API slash scan, you know, hash life hack, um, then you get a full JSON enumeration of the visual representation of what you just saw. Um, it's subject to rate limiting with the same thing as the UI. Um, so yeah, no API keys needed. So yeah, just go nuts I, and just tell me what you build. Like, yeah, that's all I really want to know, to be honest. <laughs> and his, his follow-up question, was, does it have built-in support for refresh hit responses or is it assuming only a miss or a hit? Uh, I do interpret some refresh hits when, as a hit, when it will serve it back to the end user immediately and refresh in the background. If you need to refresh by the CDN talking to the origin that then needs to come back and then the whole pipeline finish, then I count that as a, like a, a not a cache hit, if you know what I mean. So. And that's where I might need someone's, like, if I am interpreting it wrong for your particular CDN, then um, let me know. Um, I know uh, Akamai does um, refresh hits, and they come back as refresh hits in the in the UI. But I think in that particular situation, Akamai actually goes all the way back to origin to verify it's valid, and then they send it on to the end user. Um, Yelena is very complimentary in case any of the developers of the Tier World site are here um, <laughs> about the uh, response times of their pages. So, yeah, have you found any other um, AA plus sites on your travels? No, I haven't really had a chance to use the tool so much. I'm too busy building the tool. So, but that's definitely we'll that for... video where you're trying to build the plane when you're flying it. Um, so, we'll yeah, I'm, that's why I'm his... kind of. API yeah. caller. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, I'm definitely keen to know if anyone else can get an A plus, um, or you know anything you kind of find is kind of maybe kind of unjustified. Um, but coming then to the future, um, I haven't really, um, I haven't really kind of ranked and stacked sites, and I don't really want to do that because I don't, again, what I said earlier, I don't really want to come up with a shameless, but um, that's not the point of the tool. But what I might do, and yeah, keen for everyone's suggestions here as well, is but if you're scanning like a, say a .com.au, I might give you a position against the other .com.au sites. So like, hey, your position nine out of 57 .com.au sites that have been scanned. Um, so you kind of know where you stand roughly without kind of like pointing a big, um, you know, point, point, point stick in your face. Um, but yeah, that's in terms of the gamification elements quite light at the moment. It's more on, akin to SSL labs where it kind of just gives you the score, a grade, um, and uh, kind of leaves you be. Um, there's another site I do use called securityheaders.io, which kind of has leaderboards and stuff like that as well. So um yeah like I, i'm just on the fence about leaderboards and you know shame boards so like at the moment they don't exist it's good to know that we both said exactly the same thing um yeah i think <laughs> <laughs> the uh, i think this is a great tool and it's fantastic alongside ssl labs alongside security headers we know we all want to be better um I know that in a lot of situations, trying to get the resources or the time or the allocations we need to be better is difficult. So yeah, if you can use this site and others as part of your business case towards why caching is important and why performance is important, then yeah, let us know. Let us know if the if it's of use to you. Um, thank you so much to everyone for coming, for asking questions and for putting up with Sean's power outage. Um, much appreciated. <laughs> Sean and I are going to be in the Amazing IO sponsor session in a couple of hours' time, talking a little bit more about some of the more proactive stuff we do um, to help keep people's sites up, running, alive, and happy. Um, have a good day.